please, big hand for the speakers. Right. Could you just move back slightly? Move back. Thanks. That's better. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Butcher. I am the editor at large for TechCrunch. Have you heard of TechCrunch? I can't hear you. Right. Um, we're going to do a little chat now about some of the biggest players in Silicon Valley. I hope you enjoy it. Um, afterwards, I can hang around over here and chat to some people if you want to come and talk to us over there. But we'll get off state. Actually, we'll just go over there, right? So, but uh, be cool, be cool, okay? Relax. Hiya, guys. Great. Um, let me just get my notes here. So, we have... Um, do, 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 do. I'm having a great time here. Ashraf from Facebook. Yes, sir. There he is. Big hand for Facebook. Jambu from Uber. And Sherry from Google. Sharif. I wish my mum had called me Sharif. <laughs> Such a cool name. Um, gentlemen, um, it's really great to see you. Um, one of the fantastic things, I think, about technology is how empowering it is uh, to people. And, um, you, know, for, you know, obviously, Facebook has been incredibly empowering uh, to communities. I started a, uh, Facebook, I've started many Facebook groups and, you know, from, you know, just those kinds of things just completely sort of flower, don't they? What, what are the kinds of things that Facebook's doing to um, enable small businesses to thrive here right now? Uh, thanks, Mike. The Middle East, and in particular Egypt, is a like very that. unique place for us. Uh, here's, a little, here's a little tip. Wait, when you're presenting, you hold your mic like a rock star, like that, yeah? So the Middle East is a very important area of the world for us. Our population there now ex exceeds 114 million that access Facebook every year. More than 100 million of them access Facebook on mobile. That's, that's a clear indication of the future that we're heading towards. Uh, we see tremendous innovation coming out from the region. Egypt, by far, is, well, is one of uh, very unique markets for us. We see a level of innovation, a level of creativity. We see startups that are using our platforms. Uh, a number of our platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, in a way to connect the unconnected and to get their messages across, to deliver a new level of innovation across the Egyptian market, and to connect a lot of their customers. In Egypt, we're proud to announce we have close to 26 million users that access Facebook every month. Uh, more than 88% of them access Facebook on mobile. So that, again, despite the low penetration of smartphones in Egypt, there is tremendous opportunity. How are we helping them? 2016 is going to be a very important year for Facebook in the region, in particular in Egypt. We're launching a number of initiatives. One of them is Facebook Start, which is one of our initiatives to support uh, uh, app developers on our platform. We've just also announced uh, a week ago that we're launching the Innovation Challenge for Africa. The first award is going to be $150,000 for any app that delivers uh, education and cultural uh, economic opportunity for the users across our uh, different platforms. So that's a lot of activity and Facebook Start, that's going to be aimed at app developers using a, uh, Facebook APIs uh, and stuff like that. That sounds pretty cool. I mean, uh, what are the, what are the, uh, uh, Google for instance, I mean, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for, for Google in the MENA region right now? Yeah, I think um, we see a lot of opportunity here. We have been for a while, and I think the last year and, and the coming year are going to be very exciting for us. Uh, we also have a number of initiatives mostly aimed at SMBs or small businesses, entrepreneurs, uh, educational initiatives aimed at students, um, and general business, uh, basically enabling businesses here with technology platform uh, like Google Apps, like uh, content creators on YouTube, uh, very big in the Middle East. I think in Saudi Arabia we have, is one of the top 10 uh, YouTube uh, subscriptions and watchers that we see. We they are, love YouTube in Saudi Arabia, don't they? They love YouTube, Is yeah. it because their television is so bad? <laughs> is it, was that right, yeah? TV in Saudi is bad? Must be. 
That's why they're watching so much YouTube. <laughs> we are, we're also excited about you know, developer programs. Uh, we have the mobile app Launchpad program that we're training 2,000 Egyptians. Oh, we've got a fourth member of the panel. Uh, we s so we need to talk about cat economics. That's right. Um, <laughs> So, the, the, animal, the animals love us here too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, both for humans and animals. But I think, um, you know, developers, starting with the developers, I think there is a, an area where we can enable people to grow and learn. And that even starts in, in the academic sphere. So, like, helping students gain the skills that they can. Uh, that's really important for us. You're also very involved in the investment side of things, aren't you? Um, from an investment perspective, uh, Google has various investment vehicles, Google Ventures, Google for Entrepreneurs, things like that. From an investment perspective, is uh, um, Egypt and is uh, the MENA region generally something that Google is looking at uh, from an investor perspective? So, you know, we recently announced that we, we took our European Google Ventures fund and combined it with our, our main go, uh, fund at Google Ventures, and we're combining that to be a, a global fund. Yeah. The actual details and where we're going to prioritize is still TED, but um, I personally, yeah, my program that we work at, we work with VCs and startups at, at Google in Silicon Valley, and we're expanding all over the world. And I wouldn't say that you know the Middle East is in the top ten of startup ecosystems yet. Uh, but the growth rate here is faster than most of the growth rates that we've seen, like in Brazil yeah. and even in, in APAC. So it's very exciting times, and I think we are going to start looking closer at it. And I'd say we generally, the investment community, not just Google, uh, are looking at the region much more closely than before. I think we've seen some unprecedented deals where U.S. and European VCs have invested and led rounds yeah. uh, for companies that are based here, not necessarily just Middle Eastern companies who've moved to those regions. Yeah. They've actually, like Fetcher in the UAE, the 11 million dollar round by NEA and that's very exciting for us we're seeing a lot more of that activity we have uh, at least over a dozen new VC firms formed in MENA and we you know investors that are outside are starting to partner with the VCs here and collaborate on looking at deal flow so it's super exciting I think that's a very good point and certainly from my perspective at TechCrunch I'm based in London and as far as I can see there are there's a lot of interest amongst VCs partnering with big global firms like Google and using, and using that as a basis to look at the MENA region generally. Often because of the proximity of a city like London, for instance, or you know, European countries. So that's a very good point. Turning to Uber. So Uber, um, you know, not necessarily known for, as such um, in terms of op entrepreneurs, but the cool thing about it is that because you have this amazing API, and I know Chris Saad actually, who. Uh, in the valley who runs the API side of things, um, really allowing uh, app developers to use Uber, Uber as you know, in, in, inside their apps. And that's something you're really pushing out here right now, yeah? Well, I guess I, I would challenge a little bit the, the premise about uh, the entrepreneurship point, right? Because Uber's, yeah, yeah. Uber's ultimately a platform uh, and our customers are two-sided. There's riders and there's drivers. And, the drivers, for the most part, are entrepreneurs, right? Business right. owners that start and create businesses on the back of the platform with flexibility and opportunities to earn. In Egypt, 40% of the drivers that are coming onto the Uber platform are previously unemployed. It's a huge opportunity for job creation and entrepreneurship and empowerment, which are clearly aligned with the goals of, of the region. Um, yeah. so, so for me, that is, I think, bringing entrepreneurship beyond just the classical tech entrepreneurship sort yeah. of lens and into, into a broader ecosystem. Um, on, top of, on, on top of that, um, you know, we've signed some great partnerships recently uh, with uh, Bayolok, for example, uh, in, in, in Egypt around integrating our product into existing APIs. Uh, and for us, that's really how we think about uh, empowerment and enablement. Can you use Uber, a product that can help a person get from point A to point B and connect that into the apps that they're already using, whether that's for travel, entertainment, uh, or, or, or anywhere in between. And um, you're also, um, uh, you know, your appeal to small businesses is pretty obvious as well. Certainly I've been using Uber while I've been in Cairo, and frankly, I don't think I could get around this city without using Uber, to be honest with you, or perhaps a similar service, but that's the one that I use most often, um, certainly in London as well. Um, you, you know, there's the, what, what are the kinds of things that you're thinking of going forward? You've obviously started with a small service here, 
last year, and and and, uh, and now you're expanding, right? So is this going to be the basis from for other parts of uh, the Middle East, or or what? I mean, Cairo is a phenomenal opportunity, right? Yeah. What we get excited about is, is we're technologists, and what we get excited about is really big, complicated logistical problems. And Cairo, because of its scale, size, growth rate, urbanization, clearly presents a, a really interesting opportunity. What, what I think is perhaps the future um, is obviously geographical expansion, thinking about new products, but I think really revolutionizing how cities like Cairo work by increasing the idea of shared cars and reducing the dependence on personal car ownership. If one, of the, one of the most interesting kind of stats that I've seen recently is about 15% of a city is devoted to parking, right? Incredibly inefficient use of space. Yeah. Imagine if we could repurpose that for public spaces, parks, universities, yeah. office complexes get that space back and give it back to people. And for us, the idea of people becoming less dependent on personal car ownership and more dependent uh, and, and, and more interested in using shared services um, is, you know, is, is a really interesting paradigm shift, particularly in large urban cities. What do you think are some of the, uh, the challenges uh, are um, uh, operating uh, in tech in uh, the Middle East at the moment? I mean, obviously, we've got the, the, some of the, the political issues going on, and we're all familiar with that. And, you know, it seems to be in the news all the time. But, the, but in terms of, um, say, you know, startups and, uh, you know, basic things, what do you think some of the challenges? You know, do, uh, do we need to unpack broadband more? Needs to be more de there probably needs to be a lot more de deregulation around telecoms, I think, at this point. I was just in Beirut, and that, they really need more competition there. Um, is that ever something that ever comes up for you, for you guys? We all recognize it's a challenging region. Uh, we tend sometimes to lump it all together as yeah. one country. Yeah, totally, While yeah. at the end of the day, it's 22 complex, different countries, different approaches, different dynamics. But still, I think, and it goes for all the tech industry, this is where we see opportunity. It's, it's tremendous yeah. opportunity that outweighs all of the challenges we've seen here. Uh, six weeks ago, we've launched Free Basics, which uh, is uh, our initiative in partnership with the Salat Egypt that aims to connect the unconnected and provide uh, free data for users that have never been, have never experienced uh, the internet before. And so far, in six weeks, we've had tremendous success in Egypt. And that's an indication of the hunger of the people here for connectivity, for openness to the internet, so that they can change their lives, they can get an education, they get, so they can advance their careers or build startups. And how we see it, these opportunities, despite the challenges, it creates amazing opportunities for companies like us to grow, to become part and parcel of the fabric of societies here. So honestly, mm. at this stage, we only see opportunity. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, I think. And also the, uh, the opportunity for app developers and to startups to reach audiences through social media uh, is incredibly powerful. Um, and I, uh, I bet, I'm not sure you would, you would say this, but I can ha happily say this, which is that certainly uh, apps, uh, app adoption off a Facebook platform is incredibly high. Um, and uh, it's often, I often wonder kind of why Facebook doesn't push uh, app uh, downloading far more on, on Facebook, um, actually. Honestly, I always tell people, this is one of the regions that despite a lot of the stereotypes you, that you hear in other, uh, in media, yeah. this is where we get a lot of innovation. Yeah, but yeah. The one challenge that we see, a lot of the innovation is just focused on serving what we're calling now an Arab digital generation, which is around 200 million young Arabs who are very digital, who are very connected. We think that one of the challenges for the future is to see apps going and targeting export markets. And this is something that I think creates tremendous opportunities for attendees here at Rise Up or other things. Where we see a lot of businesses that are only focused either on Egypt or on the Arab world. Yeah. And we see there are tremendous opportunities to take it to the next level and start aiming for exporting your apps, exporting your products. And that's something that fits Facebook significantly. And we've done tremendous success with other countries that have been exporting apps around the world. So I think we're just at the beginning of that stage. And I think there's a lot of potential. And I'm sure that in a couple of years, we're going to see an app that has significant downloads, significant appeal to a global clientele, not just an Arab or an Egyptian clientele. 
I, I agree, and I think that um, the, uh, uh, certainly European entrepreneurships are the ones, European entrepreneurships that I'm most familiar with generally, they are now getting out of the, the mindset of just thinking like we're going to launch in Germany or France or the UK and going for that international audience. I mean, certainly Google um, and Android has been a massive success uh, in this region, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think access to Android has been a lot easier for folks in the Middle East, and so developers are very hungry to learn the skills uh, to be able to develop on that platform. They can get to market a lot faster with a lot less uh, restrictions um, to their to their workflow and getting to market. And and we have programs in place specifically to help them, educate them, and get them uh, more. You know, get them the tools that they need to build their businesses faster. And you know, we mentioned Google Ventures. I think one of the divisions at Google Ventures called Google for Entrepreneurs uh, really is looking at the region a lot more now. Yeah. We opened our first, uh, our first on the ground tech hub in Dubai called Astro Labs. We just had the inaugural open last month. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at other partners to, to partner with in the region to help foster, foster development and entrepreneurship and education. Um, in 2011, we launched the, the Google local domain here in Egypt and YouTube local domain. Um, those are also uh, ways that we can start to do more Arabic uh, content as well. And we think localizing the content will help facilitate for a lot of the non-English speaking uh, folks out here. So giving access sort of to the long tail. And you mentioned challenges and I think, you know, there's, there's several that I could talk about. But Ashraf mentioned a very big one, which is it's not a homogeneous unit and yeah. when we talk to when I talk to investors in the US about looking at the region it's just chaotic I mean there's too many different countries to think about but we think about it as a region as one region uh, you know Arabic speaking population that's over 400 million people that that rivals the US population as a market um, but the underlying challenges for that are that IP is not protected the same way across these regions shipping and logistics are not protected the same way or predictable in the same way so for commerce sites mm. that's creating at the same time opportunities for a lot of the entrepreneurs here because they understand the local nuances of their businesses so you'll see a food delivery company whereas an, an outside food delivery company had a hard time moving in but a local one will be able to cater to you know the audience here maybe do cash on delivery maybe do um, you know, book the ride in advance for, for some kind of ride sharing, or lots of different kinds of localization things that we're seeing. And that's, that's a, a barrier of entry of sorts for them. So it's an opportunity at the same time that it's a challenge. It's interesting you should mention logistics because um, obviously uh, Uber is in the, in the, kind of in the logistics business in terms of people and transportation. And I think it's probably no secret that uh, Uber is thinking about, you know, the next 10 years of, of transportation and logistics. Uh, given its, its moves to uh, in artificial intelligence and robotics and things like that. Um, but uh, Uber, op in Europe, I know, for instance, Uber often op operates uh, other businesses like food delivery and stuff like that. You know, in Barcelona, food delivery is all Uber does, in fact. Uh, do you think that food, food would become something that Uber would do in the region or in Egypt? I mean, I think there's a huge, huge potential for adjacent businesses built off of really the idea of efficiency in a mobile logistics world, right? Once, all, all Uber is is a car to you in four minutes. If we can get a car to you in four minutes, there's really nothing that we can't get to you. One of the, you know, one of the questions I get a lot here is, why does Uber not accept pre-bookings? Right? Yeah, and, yeah and why does Uber not well, accept pre-bookings? I really it, like that. No, I think it's an interesting question because I think it ties to this, this question about logistics a bit yeah. too, right? Which is, for platforms to be efficient, the easiest way and the most efficient way to build those platforms out is to build real-time engines that are based on potential efficiency. And if you think about pre-bookings, they're comparatively inefficient because drivers have to go offline for an hour before that pre-booking. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I, I booked a, a pre-booking through one of our competitors before Uber launched in that city at the airport, and my flight was delayed two hours. So the driver was offline for the hour before, because he was waiting for my pre-booking. He was offline for the two hours my flight was delayed, and then he picked me up and took me where I needed to go. So in four hours, he did one trip. And that means comparatively higher prices that customers have to pay, and fewer drivers available online at any given time. So now when you wake up in Cairo, or you need to go to the airport at four o'clock in the morning, you can get a car in four minutes. So why do you need the pre-booking? 
In the lens of logistics, that real-time supply chain is incredibly powerful because what it does is it builds in more efficient options for the transport of things like food or parcels or whatever yeah. it may be. And I think that's a core part of you know, our vision. We don't have an exact timeline on, on when, when we think about those services here, but you know, I imagine it'll be soon. Um, let's talk now about edge um, skills, education, jobs, talent. Um, obviously, everybody, you're all incredibly talented people, aren't you? Right? Um, yes, you are. Um, so when you're, you guys are doing your, um, uh, you know, operate, setting up your operations, getting things going, I mean, there's some great people to draw on to, you know, to hire here and also great uh, startups to work with and partner with. Where are, the, uh, where are the gaps in the system right now? Do we need more engineering talent, more hackathons, more codes, you know, uh, code schools? What do you think? Uh, I think you've, you've answered the question. Anyone here who has a coding uh, talent, who's very good at coding, please see me and I'll send you where you can apply to Facebook. That's the one function that we're dying to get the talent. The region has tremendous talent, tremendous talent potential, but unfortunately we don't see a lot of coding schools. We don't see a lot of coding initiatives. And this is a function that will exist, that will be recruited for the next 20, 30 years. This is something that we are realizing the deficiency and we're starting a number of hackathons across the Middle East in 2016 to address our needs. Some of them are recruiting hackathons. So we'll go to a number of universities across the Middle East and choose talent that we think is very suitable for Facebook to work in our offices around the world. But at the same time, we'll work on hackathons on future events like Rise Up where we can instill the spirit of what it means to be a hacker, to be an engineer, a coder at Facebook. This is one job that I think we'll continue to have deficiency for the years to come because there is tremendous potential and the good potential out of the region, I think, will easily get recruited by global tech companies and move to their global headquarters. But I think we need to start somewhere. And I think for anyone who's considering a career shift, this is the one thing that you can easily do. I've seen people who are 42 years old and who've dropped their jobs, took coding lessons, and they're currently working with tech companies. So no one has an excuse nowadays. And what about uh, you guys? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add a couple points on that. I think, you know, the Middle East is very exciting because it's like 1970s in Silicon Valley. I mean, it w there was no startup ecosystem then. And it was seeded with a few, you know, PhDs from Stanford or whatever that decided to spin off a technology and build a company around it to commercialize it. That company did well. All the employees do well because everyone has shares and that's part of being in a startup ecosystem is, is you share the wealth with your employees. If it does well, all boats rise. And that's, that's going to feed into more angel investors, more founders, building more things. And Egypt in particular has an army of technical talent. It is crazy how much technical talent is here, especially compared to the region, but it can serve the entire world from, from that basis. So we love to see innovation and technology being born here with a global application. I think in the short term, we see another type of startup, which is also needed in the area now, which is we see global successes being, I don't like to say too much copycat, but localized to the region. And we need that for now. I mean, those yeah. businesses will survive. I think they'll get investors from the region. There's, a, there's always, in any country, there's always going to be gaps in the market that are just going to get plugged by existing solutions. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so, we do a lot with SMB partner program to train small businesses on how to use technology for their businesses, whether it's commerce or services, Google apps, cloud maps, APIs, those types of things, just to kind of enable. Um, in the last year or two, we've, we've increased our maps coverage in the Middle East quite tremendously. It's still, you might have, you know, a few issues here and there, but even our traffic data in Cairo just in the last three months has improved dramatically, uh, which will help our partners that are using our APIs. I think our, we're partnered with Udacity for mobile app launchpad to get mobile app developers um, increased uh, skill sets. And just, just in the last batch that graduated, uh, we're on our second batch for that now, but the first batch that graduated had an 80% success rate on the Udacity program compared to 40% before we got involved. So those kinds of things, I think the technical talent here will serve Egypt, it will certainly serve the region, and it can potentially serve the world. Previous to this, I think 
in Jordan and in Beirut and Egypt all had technical talent before, but the best of class would end up getting shipped out to US or Europe companies. We would want to see a lot more of those kind of staying in the region, building up in the region. Yeah. And that's just the technical side. I think when I go to Dubai, we see a lot of design, creativity, marketing skills, businesses and services, but they're much lacking in, in the technical talent. Mm. Egypt can serve to, to serve the engineers for all of that. Yeah, I, I, I do, but have you, are you finding the talent you need to, to get set up here and, uh, and run the business? I think one of the important things for our business is in every city we go to, we hire a local team, it's sort of our way of ensuring that our business remains deeply empathetic to what's necessary in a local market. We've got an amazing team here in Egypt, and, and for us, that has been probably the biggest driver of comparative success. So I think that investment will continue. I think I agree with, with everything these guys have said about the need for more of a focus on the, um, on the skills uh, and, 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 uh, and, and more of an opportunity for people to show that and prove that. Are we going to see any Uber hackathons happening? Cairo anytime soon? Yeah, I'd love to do it. We've started doing them in, in a lot of our global offices. I would love to, love to be able to do one in Cairo soon. Fantastic. So, um, like, you know, during, you know, during to a close, what are the kinds of, visit, what's the kinds of things that are going to be happening over here in the, the next couple of years, do you think? You've got, so you've got your start program initiative. Uh, you've obviously building out your business, Uber. Um, Google, obviously, multiple, multiple channels. Um, or is it Alphabet? Um, I can never decide anymore. Um, launching rockets, God knows what you'll do, be doing. Um, uh, what's some of the, um, what are some of the sort of plans over the next couple of years uh, for the region? Go ahead, guys. Yeah, I can give it a start. I think we're, you know, take every layer of the ecosystem of, of an economy, uh, starting with students, starting with SMBs and entrepreneurs and developers, and we're providing solutions and tools and support for them to be able to be able to like you know teach the teach them to fish rather than do all the fishing for them. Um, and I see that happening. The rate of that uh, occurring is is tremendous. I mean, we see the delta of what a startup can do here in a year on hundred thousand dollars versus in Silicon Valley. You don't get that anymore. You don't get that scrappiness anymore. Yeah. Uh, but it's really inspiring to see that happening now. To be able to leverage global tools and systems that they see. They read TechCrunch, they read all these things, and they learn, and they'll be able to, you talk to them, you would imagine they're in Silicon Valley, because, but they're here, and they're doing it here, despite yeah. all the challenges. I think we are trying to support a lot more on content creation, media, uh, especially yeah. in Saudi, like we were talking about with YouTube content creator programs. In Bahrain and uh, other places in the UAE, we are uh, supporting STEM uh, quite a bit. So STEM for women, and, and in general, for uh, minorities and people who wouldn't have access to that, uh, before to try to level the playing field for access to education and in speaking in, of access I guess that, that goes even broader than practitioners it's just users in general uh, providing internet access or bringing you know as we say the next billion users online and and Facebook is, is, is doing helping doing the same thing I think giving people just access to the internet changes their life forever I mean they're able to do just with a laptop in front of them or a mobile device able to find all the information they need, learn whatever they need. There's several local platforms on education providing, like nefham.com, providing complete curriculums for Egypt and other countries online for anyone who doesn't have uh, the privilege uh, to find a school that, to provide that. So that's, yeah. that's the first layer of just sort of access and information. Yeah. I mean, the let's basics. Let's get the right? basics right. Yeah, let's get the what basics are, right. What's, think, what's Uber looking like in the next couple of years? I think it's, it's simple. It's, it's more riders, more drivers, yeah. more cities, more products, right? And there's yeah. still a long way to go. Um, but, but I think the, the energy and excitement that, that we've got for our business in, in this part of the world is, is incredible. We recently kind of announced a $250 million investment in MENA, and, and my hope is that's just the beginning. Yeah. And uh, Facebook? You've got your start program, you've got yeah. a lot of the stuff going on. We think that, honestly, technology is the biggest opportunity the region has had in years. It's, the region is behind uh, Western world on many aspects. And I think technology and the tools that are available for startups and entrepreneurs will allow a lot of them to bridge the differences. We're doing our best to continue to improve our platforms, to provide ideas, to provide education, and to provide what we call the stepping stones. But at the end of the day, it's startups and entrepreneurs that have to do the walking, and we're just here to support them. 
we remain committed to the region. We think, again, technology is the biggest opportunity that we've had in the Middle East in ages. And it's up to everyone here and, other, and thousands of others of startups and entrepreneurs and coders to use this opportunity to develop their ideas and to, to, to improve their lives and, in essence, improve the future and the potential of the region. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. And certainly from my perspective at TechCrunch, we would like to uh, cover the region more fully and um, perhaps bring uh, maybe an event here one day at some point. Um, would you like that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, won't, uh, we won't be competing with Rise Up. We love Rise Up. We'll just do some maybe a meetup or something sometime. Um, but thank you very much. Um, my name is Mike Butcher from TechCrunch. You can email me, mike at techcrunch.com. Um, not all at once, though, please. Um, and uh, so see you around. Thanks very much. We Thanks. had a great panel. Thanks to the panel. Okay, good stuff.